Welcome to Catherine Raker's World. Innovation. Culture. Adventure. Fashion and health. Artists. Destinations. Traditions. This is Catherine Raker's World. I'm Catherine Raker of Catherine Raker's World. I'm honored to be in Atlanta, Georgia with one of the most exciting ministers I've ever met on this earth. And he had been on my radio show about three years ago. And I thought his life was compelling then. So this is about the fourth, fourth program that we're doing in the continuing series of Pastor Seven. And I am so excited about being here, meeting the people you have saved and saving yourself with God who saved you like Paul. Yes. And um, so we're talking about the ministry now in 2006, I think we are. And welcome back to our show, Thank Pastor you. Seven. Your people are miraculous in my brain. And what you're doing here, like I said before, needs to be everywhere in our country as a model because it's all selfless. It's God's work. Am I right? You're correct. That's fine. So let's go from when we came back and you started the ministry. You were given what when you got out of jail? You had $100 in your pocket. Is that right? 32 cents. 32 cents. Yeah. 32 cents. That's not a lot. No. <laughs> So what did you do with 32 cents? Nothing. Nothing. Well, where did you go? Did they just drop you? They dropped you at your brother's or somebody picked you up no. or what happened? When I first got out of prison, they sent me to a halfway house down on window court, down on Fulton Industrial. Right. So I had to go to halfway house first and, and then uh, that's when they want to hook me up in NA and AA because I was a drug addict, alcoholic before I went to prison and stuff. And uh, that didn't work out too good. Why didn't it work out? You mean the 12 steps of... The NA and AA, they want you to stand up in a crowd and uh, tell everybody, hey, my name is Dan Wells, I'm an alcoholic or I'm a drug addict. And God taught me while I was in prison when I started reading the Bible in 98 to never use that, that words to bring harm to myself. Because okay. he said in Proverbs 18, 21, I got the power of my tongue to be life of death and those who love it eat his fruit. And then he said in Proverbs 6, 2, don't be snared up with the words of your own mouth. So I tried to tell that to the instructor at the NA and AA facility. And they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. Exactly. So I got in trouble and they had to call my case manager. And, but God was on, gave me favor and so he took me out of the NA and AA program. Because mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't cooperate with them. I'm not going to speak depth about myself. Let me ask you this question. Looking back then, you know, God showed you the way to work with alcoholics and drug addicts and people that were lost, prostitutes, whatever it may be. And we know that Christ did the same thing. Mary Magdalene was a good example of that. Yes. And he surrounded himself with the poor, the humble, the sick. I mean, you think about it. Um, what he did was unbelievable. He didn't have to do it, but he was sent on earth to do it, right? So, um, Let's talk about, now you've, you've finally found this property and you looked at all the buildings and you said to yourself, what? What do you want me to do, God? Right? Exactly. So tell me the rest of it. Well, when, when I first walked in here and, 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 well, I broke in here, actually. You broke in because you couldn't get I in. I couldn't find the key. That's right. And so I, I called Ed, Ed Knight the next morning. I said, please forgive me. I said, I broke into the church. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I couldn't find the key. So I broke in and walked around through here. And I just felt anointing so strong in this building. I just, it was all different to me. And so I come in here and sit there and started praying, asking God why you got me sitting here and questioning him. And, and um, so I, I left and shut the window back after I left and called him, apologized for breaking in. And next thing you know, he set it up with Terry Francois, which is the owner of this mm -hmm, property. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, he has a company called Francois and Company. 
He does all this gothic, big columns and stuff to decorate these rich people's homes and stuff, real beautiful mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. And so he used it like for a warehouse. It was just, you know. So it was stacked with things when you walked molds in? Molds and forms and everything he, he makes. So he, wow. yeah. So, How long did it take you to change to this? Well, when, when, when I called Ed, he, he went to Terry and, and set it up and, and for me to meet with Terry. And um, so I went to meet with Terry and Terry's wife was there and Shan, you know, Shannon and, and uh, me and Ed sit on one side and there was on the other side and me and Terry started talking and he said, you for real, aren't you? I said, yeah, I said, I'm very much for real when it comes to Jesus. I said, without a doubt. I said, if he ain't mm -hmm. in it, I quit it. Mm -hmm. And so he looked at Shannon and Ed and said, would y'all please leave the conference room and let Pastor Seven and myself talk. So we sit there and he looked at me and said, I believe that you're real about the way you feel about the homeless and you being a homeless minister. And, Cause he knew I didn't have no money. And uh, he said, what do you want to do? I said, I said, we can't do anything at least five years to her. I said, there's no sense of even adventuring off on it. And he looked at me and said, I'll give you the church for five years and let's see what happens free. And then, so I, I called my team up and some, some supporters of mine and we got them out here one night and we walked the building seven times and, and come in the double doors on the seventh time, come to the altar. And we started praying, just giving everything to God, mm -hmm. building a foundation to where it's supposed to be built on God. Mm -hmm. And then um, next thing you know, God just put in my heart, said, turn it in. He said, he said, clean the sanctuary out and let's get it open for service. So I had 17 men living with me at the same time in my house over on Brownsville Road. And we come over here and we started getting these moles out of here and the, the pews was all tore to pieces and stuff. And, and we started putting things back together, and, and it was just a matter of probably four weeks. We, we had our first service here on May 6, 2007, wasn't it? We opened up, yeah. So we had our first, yeah. And we done our first Sunday service here with like 320 standing room only. It wow. was just, it was amazing. Wow. But this wasn't homeless people. These were people that knew me and... and they were your supporters. <clears throat> right. And then... So uh, after that... How long did it take before you started bringing the men in? And then you brought women to always, I was already doing men. You were already doing men, yeah. but you needed to. I was going to explore this place and turn into a bigger men's ministry. Oh, that was my plans in the, in the beginning. In the beginning. Yeah. When but did it change? About three weeks after I opened this place up, God started dealing with me with the women and children was meeting up under the bridges and and then we'd done that corporate prayer out there and asked God to send us somebody to help us do, do more with the women and children that was bumping into up under the bridges. And who came to you then? Um, come to me. Now, who became that person? Well, that person didn't ever surface. Uh, it came to me. It came to you to do it. Yeah. Right? And... I thought I was losing my mind. Could you think any sane man would want to live with 60 women and 47 no. children? No, no, not really. Okay, so, yeah, I've lost my mind. Lost your mind. For Christ. For Christ, yeah. right. So, having 60 women and children, um, you can actually house how many today? We can and house. How do you do it today? Well, we turn, turn to administration offices and, and uh, into dormitories. Okay. On the other side in the classrooms and stuff. We got it all out and turn them into uh, dormitories. dormitories. So, we've got, single lady, we've got 39 single ladies upstairs. With the, with the cubicles that we built for them. Right. Um, downstairs, we have 19, 19 cubicles, and we can house a total of, uh, we've housed up to 106 individuals here at, at one time. What do you see in the future in that respect? Do you see more here, or do you see them in different places across see, the country? I see it in different places. Uh, the vision is real, really a bigger place. To Simple. To be, to be able to, there's, there's so many women. They said the homeless population with women and children is lowered, but it's not true. Women hide themselves with the children and they sleep in, in, cars. in cars and warehouses and in different places. In different places okay. Because if defects sees the homeless, they take the kids away from them. So mother's very protective of the children. Right. So they hide. Right. You probably got 25 to 30 homeless people, ladies and children right now that sleeps in the parking lot at the airport. I believe yeah, that. I, mean, I believe that. I know for a fact. You do? Yeah. So do you minister them as well? 
We don't go to the airport to minister to them because it will bring a notice or, or too much. To intent. the child. To right. The but if they see us anywhere out there, and, and like today, you and your husband Bill's going to the bridges in Tent City and up under right. Right. 70 to 25, I-20 right. and 75. Right. And y- y'all going to be seeing women. I hope there's no children out there. I hope. Yeah. But yeah. We, you never know from one day to the next. Right. But Tell me the difference. And, and this may be... A, whatever, but you see people, and this is what a concept for a lot of people is, is you see people on the streets with signs and begging. Are they the homeless, especially? Some. 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 You really got to use your discernment because there are some out there that's turned into a job. because. Oh, can, yeah. And you, you see the car some. picking them up <clears throat> or them driving a Mercedes yes, or whatever, and you see... Lots of different things. The ones you look for is the ones it's already, you can tell they've been drinking or they're high on drugs. Those are the homeless ones. The ones just had to shave for a while and they look dirty and grungy. They're out there just panhandling and getting some money. And that's why sometimes people are afraid to actually roll your window down and give them a dollar or whatever, or ten dollars. Or I've seen people give them food. 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 We have a rule. Of, that's what we do. Never right. give, we never give money. Right. We never sow in the bad. Right, because you don't want to encourage them to drink right. or to do drugs, right. right? So that that's where I think that there's a difference. There's a difference between a panhandler and there's a difference between the correct. homeless correct. and where they are. Because they could be anything and everything. That's correct. They could have been rich one day and living in their car the next day. That's correct. That you don't know what's going to happen. Now let's talk about what's happening now and what happened in the last few years. Because you were... Be, became very successful with your ministry. And then what happened? Well, Did God test you somehow? Whew. Did he ever? You, well, Lawrence came and met you. Yes. Right. I was doing a lot of work with Great Atlanta Christian Academy, and, mm-hmm. and, and I had the Asian children that I was going doing retreats with, and they right. loved, loved me and the, the way I right. presented myself. I reckon the love that God gave me. Right. And um, <clears throat> one of the pastors loved the way I done Talladega retreats and with the children. And uh, he called me up and said, hey, would you come to Dallas and do a retreat for the Asian children in Dallas? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I prayed about it. I said, called him back. I said, sure, I'll come. And so uh, I went to Dallas, and, and, and I was ministering to the children. Lawrence walked in, and I, I noticed him as soon as he walked in, mm-hmm. the writer of the book, Last Lost and Lease, and, and your book too. Mm-hmm. Um, and he kept just checking me out and couldn't figure out, you know, because I was so... If you were real or not. Yeah. And then when I started bringing the word and reading the scriptures and God started revealing to him that I was very much real. And um, so after that, he, he, we went to lunch, we took a break and he asked me to come join him at the table and with him and his kids. Mm-hmm. And so I did and we talked and, and then, you know, he, he, he warned, he said, you're different. He said, you're not the same as other people I've met. And um, he told me about his life and stuff he's done. And, and I told him about what I was doing here in Atlanta and da, 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 da. And, he said, man, somebody needs to write a book about you. I said, nah. I said, many people have asked, but I said, it'll never happen. He said, why? I said, because I don't trust a lot of people. And then it's true. I mean, it's, I don't. And um, When you can understand why. Yeah. Because I had so many people trying to take this ministry away from me. Right. I mean, many people. But so then after the book came out, then when did all the trouble start? About two years ago, um, I went on vacation. And... Um, I come back, and I've been back about a week, and um, um, this little girl told a, told a lie on me and uh, mm-hmm. that, I, that I, I, I... That she touched her. I assaulted her or whatever. Okay. And um, so the detective, he, he calls me up, and I'm at the doctor's office, and says, Mr. says this Mr. Wells? I said, yes, it is. He said, uh, would you mind coming to my office? I want to talk to you about something, a case I'm going over. And I had no problem with that because I, I ain't done anything. And so I said, yeah, sure. I said, let me finish the doctor's office. I'd be more glad to come to see you. And um, so I get some medication and everything. I come by the church. He called me and said, he said, where are you at? He said, are you coming? I said, yes, sir, I'm coming. I'm dropping off the medicine in my apartment. I'll be at the church. I'll be there in 15 minutes. So I go in there and I meet him, shake his hand and whatever. And, and he looked at me and um, he said, uh, I've, I've got this case I'm working on and you're being accused of something. I said, excuse me? Excuse me? What did you, you just say? He said, you're being accused of this this whatever, I don't even want to mention it, but, you know. And I said, dude, I said, you lost your mind. I said, I ain't done nothing like that. 
I said, I'm willing to come here to talk to you. And I said, you, you want to accuse me of this? He said, look, I got your record. He said, I've seen what you've done in your past. And I'm talking about all my crimes and the burglaries and the robberies and whatever. And all the time that you spent in prison, yeah, prison before you He said, I got, he said I got you. I said, sir, I said, please do me a favor. I said, don't judge me for my record. I said, I've had several FBI agents done done investigation over me and I applied for a presidential pardon. I said, I'm trying to get my life back together. And I said, for 18 years, I mean, for 15 years, I've been serving God and being a pillar of the community, reaching out to the last, lost, and the least. And I said, I'm, I'm doing exactly what God tells me to do. I said, please don't do this to me. I said, please go to the church and walk in the dormitories and you'll see there's 19 other mothers in there and 47 children. This is impossible. It never happened. Please believe me. So he walks out of the room, stay going about a minute. He come back into me, he says, Mr. Wells, stand up and put your face in the wall. Put your hands behind your back. I said, you going to do this? I said, you going to ruin my life and you're not even going to investigate the church or anything? Put your hands behind your back and hush. I said, okay, I'm a pastor. I mean, I got to, you know. You got to do what he asked you to do. <laughs> yeah, and so I, mean, I wouldn't say, he just told me to hush. He said, don't say another word. I said, okay. So next thing you know, he takes me into another room and then this other, they come in there and start stripping me down and take all the stuff out of my pockets and whatever. I said, you really going to put me in jail? I said, you really going to ruin my life? But something never happened. He said, I got you. He said, I look at your record. I said, okay. So they locked me up. I go to jail. I wind up in, in, in Opod over at Cobb County Jail. And, and, and uh, next thing you know, the next morning, I'm scatterbrained. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm crying out to God. God, why are you forsaking me? Why are you doing this to me, God? What I do? I said, I've served you. I've done everything. And I was mad, you know. And, and, and then um, the second day, I mean, I'm still mad and steaming. And, you know, I'm saying, God, why have you done this to me? Why did you forsake me? And I went, you know, it, it hurt. I was hurt because he knew I was innocent. I knew I was innocent, but nobody else, nobody else did. A lot of my family and friends and everybody knows I, they know me that I didn't do anything like that. But it's just. The, the, the way the Satan was trying to put in your head, yeah, well, they really do think that about you. They really do think that about you. And I'm going, God. Oh Did they check the story out? Never. Four days after I'm in jail, they finally come investigate the church. Four days after I'm in jail. But they already put me on Channel 2, Channel 5, Channel 11, Channel 46, New York Daily Times, all over, just scattered me all over the world and just ruined me all over Google and everything. And to this day. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here. God brought you, Bill, and it's, it's all divine. And tell me, so they didn't investigate it. No. They put you on two years. They, when I went to jail for 35 days, 34 days, and on the 34th day I went, went to court and they put, up, put me up on a $100,000 bond. Bond. And then one of my buddies had to do a property bond with the money. And then I got out and, and the next day they made me come back to uh, pretrial. And so I sit there with that lady in pretrial and she's telling me all this stuff and this nasty stuff. And I'm going, what are y'all talking about? I'm innocent. I said, I ain't done anything. You can't go to grocery stores. You can't go to parks. You can't go to this place. You can't go this place anywhere a child's at. If you're in a restaurant and child walks in, you got to walk out. And I'm, I mean, I'm tripping inside my head. I mean, because I've never been through anything. This is the worst of the worst. Now, let me ask you this child and her mother lived here at one time. Yes. Why did they accuse the, you? The, the child didn't live here, but the mother did. The mother did. The child visited. The child was never here. She used to visit, but the mother was. Right. And she, you were accused of touching the child. Correct. Right? And never did. Correct. My question is, when did they figure that out? Uh, the seventh time I thought I go went two years. Of, you know, I don't went through the judge six times. Right. Trying to get a hearing date. Right. But they kept postponing it, postponing it, because the prosecutor had no, they had no case. They had no case. No case. No evidence. None. I was not even, my identity was never even brought up from the young girl whatsoever. I was never identified as, as the, the individual. I mean, the, the detective pulled up Seven Bridge Recovery and pulled my picture up and said, is this the, is this the guy that done this to you? I get it. I get it. And that's how they done it. So, oh. I mean. So, it wasn't fair in any way, shape, or form. No, ma'am. So when we get to the seventh time, we finally get to court. Yeah. 
what happened then? Well, it, it, it took a miracle of God before. And I'm, I'm going to be honest. I, I want it all out there to, to, to truth. Um, the two years I had my up days, my bad days and my good days. And even now I have a, I, have a, uh, I don't fear anything. But I'm going through some things, you know, because when you sit there in, in your house for two years, the only place you're allowed to go to is see your doctor and come home. And, I mean, I had to get my girls, Dawn and Beverly, take care of me and come home and cook for me and go to the grocery store for me. And my boys come home and take care of me and, and help me out. <clears throat> so I had to still stay strong for them and not let them see, you know, I'm getting weak. And then, of course, you know. By they the, had to run the ministry while you were gone. Yeah. Well, I try to help on the phone and I try to live through their eyes and, mm -hmm. and, um, and then, you know, things just was still smooth. God, God had it because the church was built on God's foundation. And um, so, like I said, we was having the good days and bad days. And, and, and then I got depressed. Satan got in my head. I gained weight up to 286 pounds. And, That's a lot of weight. Yes, ma'am. And all the fat was pushing my lungs and everything against my body organs. And it was really hurting my, my legs swelled up like that. And so I wound up in the hospital with congestive heart failure. Yeah, I almost, almost died. Yeah. And doing this mess. And um, so I got out of the hospital eight days later, and, and, and God said, Nope, you ain't going out. You ain't going We're out. We're not going to take you out now. Nope. God said, You ain't going out. And so get back here, and I start working out, and start getting on the right diet, and start to get my health. I'm down to 241 now, and going to my doctor on every Thursday, and taking my shots and everything, and getting stronger. And then, like I said, then went in front of the judge six times, you know. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So the sixth time I said, can we do a motion or something? I said, I got a granddaughter that's just been born. She's nine months old. I never laid eyes on her. I said, you didn't let me go to my mother's funeral. You can't replace that. You didn't let me go to my sister's funeral. You can't replace that. You took my presidential pardon away from me that I knew that I was going to get just a matter of time. I said, you have took all this away from me. You know, I'm, I'm arguing you know, with God about this. I said, what are, we going to, what are you doing to me, God? Open me up and tell me, show me. And so finally... He, he do all this. I figured, you know, I'll be marinated. You know, I like put a piece of steak on. Yeah, the I grill. understand. I understand. You marinate the steak. I understand. But what happens when you put that steak into the refrigerator and that marinade sauce? It becomes tender. It becomes tender. God was tenderizing me. That's right. Making me more sensitive than I right. was before. Right. And I understood that, and then I seen that that was taking place in my life. But then, I knew I was getting close to the end of the you know, going through the furnace. Is one thing, being purified and sanctified. But I knew I was getting to the edge of that door. I, I was feeling that God was to release me. I was, I was studying every day. I mean, I was in the Word, praying for all my, all my people here. And uh, I got a phone call one Thursday. I went to the doctor and, and um, uh, for my lawyer, and I had a good time at the law at the doctor's office, ministering to a Catholic lady, and whatever. Teach her how to pray to Jesus, and not the priest. You know, you had a personal relationship. So I pulled in my driveway, and when I did, my lawyer called and said. Hey, get your people together. Tuesday, you're going into court. And, and I knew I was getting close to the, I just knew the door was supposed to be open for me. I felt it. He said, get your people together and show up at the courtroom Tuesday and bring all your people with you. I said, done, lawyer. I had no problem. I got that. So I called Lynn Hannah and, and all my friends, Sandra, all my, all my people. And they had sided with me. And I'm excited. And, and then I was pumped up, you know. And God, I know I'm at the end. I'm, it's, it's almost over. God's got it. The minute of six times and everything, nothing happened. What well, had happened the seventh time? Everything's the seventh. With me. Yeah, with you. Go ahead. And so, two hours later, he called me back, and he says, "Bad news." I said, "What?" He said, "They just postponed you for another month." I said, "Oh God!" So it was like it was like Satan just took a hand grenade and pulled a pin and just dropped it in my lap. Just boom! I mean, just blew me out. I mean, I was, I was, I was just, I was shaking. And it caught me off guard. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm studying my Bible and God's talking to me. And, and then Satan coming to me said, look, Sam, just take your life. Just, just go ahead and end it. And you ain't got to suffer no more. You got to go through pain no more. He said, just, he said, just take your life. And God was coming to me and God was showing me Paul in 1 Corinthians 5. He said, even when Paul was in Asia, that um, he contemplated taking his life. But he said he had to come to a realization you know that he couldn't stop unless he got into God. He got out of himself. So God was encouraged me to get, that, get Satan out of my head. But Satan was taking over. And I mean, he was got stronger and stronger. And, and I mean, I was fit to commit suicide. I mean, I was done. I was done. I was broken. It, 
And all of a sudden, God bought my computer on. And Lauren Daigle started singing the song, You Say. And I, I sit down and I started listening to it. She started punishing me. Make, make me feel better with her song. And I looked at her and she was real and I could see that she was real. And, and, and she, she did. She, she, saved, she saved me. Lauren Daigle, God used her to, to, to help you. To help, help me. And then not only did God use her to help me, but since God used her, she prepared me for my miracle I got that following Wednesday. When they told you it was over. They threw it all out. Because there was no evidence. None. None. And so we're on the road to recovery. Yes, ma'am. With you and with your ministry today. And I hear all those Harleys out there. And now this is my first time to go under the bridges. Yes, ma'am. I've always wondered what the bridges were all about. I mean, we have a lot of bridges in Cincinnati. And I've always wondered where they go and how they sleep and what they do. And you care enough. There's no money come. There's no money that anybody makes in your organization. Nope. And you have strict <coughs> rules and you have people that love you so much. And God loves you more than you can ever imagine. He brought me to you. Yes, ma'am. And, well, he brought Lawrence to me first and then he brought me to you. And the first time I talked to you three years ago, and I saw what you do today, I'm adopting your nonprofit to be part of my ministry on all of my, my media. Because, like we talked before, I'm not fake media. I know. I'm real. Yes, ma'am. And you have honored me to tell your story. And I am blessed by meeting you. And thank you. I'm blessed by meeting you, and this is a divine appointment by God. This is. The prayer of Jabez, I keep telling you, he keeps doing it to me, right? Right, Pastor Seven? Yes, ma'am. He does. And, um, and right. And we will be telling the rest of pieces of the story of the people that have touched your lives and have really believe in you and care about you. And all the people that sponsor your ministry as far as food and, and uh, vehicles or whatever. And we want to help you with your new goal, which is to do what? To move forward and, and to, uh, like you said, and I'll receive from you, put one of these seven bridges in every city of the United States because there's people everywhere that needs God. Right. Everybody. And we're coming out with a new book. Yep. And it's going to be called What? Because there's been a lot of people here in the United States, especially, especially for your case and others, that men have these false accusations against them. And so you're starting a new book and a new movement to help others. Yes. It's called What? I'll let you say it. We too. Men. Men. We two men? We two men. We two men. And that is going to help men that have been abused or accused. That's correct. And to, to help change their lives. Yes. Thank you so very much for blessing me today and, and letting me be here and really feel what you're doing. Well, thank you for being obedient to God because he sent you. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Catherine Raker's World. Don't forget.